Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Jen Tyler. I have the joy of being the pastor here at First United Methodist Church of Watertown and it is my joy also to welcome you here today as we gather to worship the Lord our God on this, the first Sunday of the season of Advent, the season that draws us close to Christmas. Friends, as we get started today, I would love to invite you to let us know that we're here, that you're here with us worshiping. Especially if you're on Facebook, please take a moment to drop a note in the comments to let us know that you're here so that we might greet one another in this virtual space as we worship online. As you do that, let us join together in our call to mission. The words that we need are before us on the screen. We gather today to worship God. Our worship helps us to be disciples who live into our mission, to be disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this new day in which we have been able to gather to worship you and to honor you. And we ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would come and fill each of these places from which we gather near and far as we seek to honor you in our time of worship and praise this and every day. In the name of Christ Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. Why don't you join together as we sing our opening song.
by sharing together in a word of prayer. As we move into our time of prayer tonight, I do have one quick announcement. I want all of our children and families to know that our Advent kits have begun to be delivered so that you can take part in our Advent activities from home. If you have not yet received a kit, we would love to know that you want one. If you could just simply call the church office, we would love to make sure to get you and your family one of those kits this week. Friends, with that, I want to invite us to join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Faithful, loving, and generous God, on this Thanksgiving weekend, as we seek to honor and worship you, we give you thanks in abundance for all the countless gifts that you have poured into our lives. God, in this time, may you know that we are grateful for the very breath that we draw, for the assurance that you walk with us in every step of our journeys and for all of those gifts that you pour into our lives, tangible and intangible. God, in this moment, let us offer our thanks and our praise and even our sorrows to you as we pray together in the silence of our hearts. God, we thank you for the assurance that you hear these prayers that we offer to you at this time. We thank you for the ways that you have heard our prayers in weeks past, especially as our community continues to grieve so very much loss. This week especially, we lift before you the family and friends of Jack Thomas, a much beloved member of our community who has returned back into your loving arms. We thank you, O oh God, for the gift of thanksgiving, and especially for all of us who were able to gather safely with friends or with family, even if it looks a little different this year. God, in the midst of this global pandemic, we know that it has brought hardship on many of our lives, and we thank you for the ways you journey alongside us, just as we continue to pray for all who are impacted, for those who are sick, who are quarantined, who are in need of healing. For the nurses and the doctor and the healthcare workers and even the families who are in need of your strength and your courage and your bold ways to lead and be together moving forward. We ask, oh God, that you provide these gifts in the name of your son, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi everyone, my name is Sandy Cole and I'm the Children's Ministry Coordinator here at First Church. Thanks so much for joining us today for our time with Young Disciples. So today we are starting a very special time of year called Advent. And it's a time of waiting and preparing for the coming of Jesus. So I thought it would be fun for us to prepare each week um, during Advent with a prayer of our own. So won't you join me in prayer and go ahead and do the actions with me as we pray together. So let's say, Dear Lord, our ears are open to hear the angels sing and our hearts and our minds are open to the message that they bring. Amen. So we just prayed for our ears and our hearts and our minds to be open. But my eyes are also open and I think around here there is something that reminds me of the Christmas story. I found some feathers. I wonder what part of the Christmas story they are from. Do you think the sheep had feathers? No. What about Mary and Joseph? Do you think they wore feathers? No. I know. I think it was the angels. I think it was from the angels who came to visit and who are among us. Hmm. 
Now, we read about angels throughout the Bible, but all of the angels in the Bible didn't always have wings. But there's something special that they all have in common. You see, they are all messengers from God. And one of the most important messages they bring is the one we're going to focus on today called hope. Now, in American Sign Language, this is the sign for hope. So won't you do this with me? We're going to say hope. Oh, I think it's like this. Hope is more than just wanting something. Hope is especially expecting something to happen and having the confidence that it will happen. And so when we hope for something, we don't just sit around and wait for it to happen. We get ready and we prepare. And I want you to imagine waiting with your friends to come over to your house. And we could just sit there and wait on the couch. And maybe they'd come and maybe they wouldn't. Now, if we hope friends will come over, we don't just sit there, but a lot of times we'll prepare. And so let's all take our feathers and we're gonna dust and clean our house. Can you dust and clean your house? Because we're hoping for our friends to come over. Now, I want you to make your hands into a little nest and have your feather gently rest there. And as you gaze at your feather and take a look at it, I want you to think about something that you hope for. And one thing you can do to prepare so that what you hope for will happen. Now, one of the other traditions we have in this time of Advent is lighting of our Advent candles. And I'm going to now turn it over to our family who will be lighting our Advent wreath at home and close us out in a prayer for Advent. My name is Jonathan, and this is my dad, Troy. Good morning. Today, we are lighting the candle of hope on our wreath. Please join us in lighting our own Advent wreath at home which is a purple candle as we lift up our hopes to God. Please join us in our echo prayer. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. For your message of hope. For your message of hope. Give us wings. Give us wings. To share your message. To share your message with the whole world. With the whole world. Amen. Amen. Today we are beginning this new sermon series titled Angels Among Us, in which we are going to be exploring the Christmas story through the lens of the angels who appear to each of the four characters in the story, Zechariah and Mary and Joseph and, of course, the shepherds. Together, as we do this, we are going to talk about how perhaps these angels might do well in our world today of sound bites and flashy headlines. 
of tweets and of hashtags. Because really, if we look at these stories, we discover that they're really good at these short lines. I mean, their favorite one, after all, was do not be afraid. As we look at the stories then of these messages, of this short message that these angels bring, and as we reflect on each of these characters' reactions to this message, we are going to be contemplating in turn what we might offer as we seek to move away from and counteract a culture of fear, instead seeking to live into the gifts that God longs for us to offer at this time and always. And so as we seek to do that, why don't you join with me in a word of prayer. Lord God, might you open our ears that we might hear you more clearly. Open our eyes that we might see you more clearly and our hearts that we might love you more deeply as you rid us from any and all distractions so that all that we see and hear and know and feel and speak are of you. Amen. So one of the things that I greatly love and appreciate about this time of year is that all around us, we are finding occasions for celebrations. Even this year, as our holidays have looked different for many of us, we're surrounded by reasons to be grateful anyway, aren't we? Now, I know personally, I didn't get to go and spend time over this holiday with my family over Thanksgiving like I usually do. But I am incredibly grateful for the friends that I did get to see, who have become my small but faithful and ever important pod in this time of COVID. You see, my Thanksgiving year uh, meal this year was all of four people instead of the usual 30 or so of my family that gathers. And I found surprising blessings in this small gathering. For example, I got to interact with and catch up with and have good conversation with every person gathered, rather than just a few. I also really appreciated how being surrounded by the kind of chaos that I come to expect from my large family gatherings, well, I didn't get that. And instead, I was surrounded by quieter and slower paced moments of the day that allowed me to appreciate the small things. And the truth is sometimes we need those still, quiet moments to help us soak in the world around us in a new way, don't we? To help us see the extraordinary hand of God, uh, the extraordinary hand and work of God in our otherwise ordinary lives. That's certainly true in our scripture reading today. In this passage I'm gonna read for you here in a moment, I imagine Zachariah, waking up that morning thinking that this was going to be like any other day. Only, of course, we quickly discover that that was not the case. And so instead of me telling you about what happens here, I want us to read it together and to see what happens. I'm going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through the beginning of verse 15 from the Common English Bible. And the words here are going to be on the screen. I'd like to invite you to read with me at this time. It says, During the rule of King Herod of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was a descendant of Aaron. They were both righteous before God, blameless in their observant of all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to become pregnant and they both were very old. One day, Zechariah was serving as a priest before God because his priestly division was on duty. Following the customs of priestly service, he was chosen by lottery to go into the Lord's sanctuary and burn incense. All the people who gathered to worship were praying outside during this hour of incense offering. An angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw the angel, he was startled and overcome with fear. The angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give birth to your son, and you must name him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many people will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the Lord's eyes. 
Here ends our scripture reading today. In many ways, for Zechariah, this seemed to be just another day at the temple. It was his turn to fulfill his priestly duties at the temple, taking time to go into the inner chamber and to worship God and ensure that everything was done properly. And yet this good and holy thing that he did turned into something more when the angel appeared. Something that neither he nor anyone else could ever have predicted. And yet on this otherwise unassuming day up to that point, well, this would become the first day in a new chapter of his life. The first day, perhaps even, in the history of the world as we once knew it. I wonder if any of you have ever had a moment like that in your life. A moment when you knew that from that moment on, your life was never going to be the same. A moment that comes maybe in a time of grief, such as when we know our lives are never going to be the same because a loved one who has been here in this life, whom we greatly love, well, as they move on into eternal glory, we know that our lives will never be the same. For others of us, perhaps this moment that we knew our life would never be the same comes in a moment of joy, such as welcoming a new family member into our lives, either through marriage or adoption or birth. Maybe your change hit you at a milestone in life, such as a graduation or getting a new job or moving to a new place or even maybe learning something about yourself that changed your worldview. Whatever it is, most of us have had these kinds of moments in our lives, haven't we? And if there is one thing that is consistent in all of these, it is that change usually brings with it a well of emotions. Some of us, we know, love change. Others of us fear it. But all of us enter into it with bits of hesitation or perhaps perhaps even a longing to know what is yet to come, don't we? That's what I imagine happening here with Zechariah when the angel comes to him. I want you to imagine this scene with me. You see, we are told that Zechariah is standing at the holy altar where he is burning incense and worshiping God. We know that he is expected to be alone. But his time of silence and of prayer and of worship and of burning incense is interrupted when Zechariah looks up and suddenly sees an angel of God standing to the right of the altar. Now remember, he was alone, right? And so in this otherwise silent sanctuary where no one was allowed, Zechariah suddenly looks up without having heard anyone enter, and someone had appeared. Now, I don't know about you, but I absolutely would have been startled by that. I mean, hopefully there are others among us, too, who would be and who can understand that, right? I mean, this passage tells us that Zechariah was startled, and that in this moment he was overcome with fear. A reaction, it's worth noting, that is apparently typical upon the appearance of angels. In fact, nearly every time an angel appears in scripture, a version of the words, do not be afraid, is said to the person who sees the angel. Now, clearly we don't know what these angels looked like, but this always makes me think that they were scary, frightening looking creatures. But that's a little bit of my own imagination getting away from me. I mean, what we actually know is that sometimes in scripture, angels are given a description. Sometimes, both in scriptures or in religious art throughout history, we are told that these angels even have wings. I mean, that's usually what I think of with an angel. Is that what you think of too? When I think of angels in that way, I think it's a bit easier to think of them as welcoming creatures. Creatures who bring good news. Creatures who don't want us to be afraid or to despair, but instead who want us to find hope. And that, I believe, is exactly what the angel longed to do this day 
when he showed up to Zechariah. You see, before this time, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth had always been faithful servants of God. But like many of us, they didn't always get what they prayed for. Zechariah and Elizabeth, this thing that they did not get was the gift of children. Some among us know that longing, that pain, and that grief, that kind of heartache that, bring, that we would wish upon no one when we have so much love to give and long to give it to a child, but we're unable to give it in the ways our hearts long for. This was the reality of Zechariah and Elizabeth, something that by now they had come to accept since they were far past their childbearing years. This passage tells us many times that they were old. Now, here in this passage, though, the angel goes on to describe how great this new child will be that they will receive. And one of the things that I really appreciate about what comes next is how Zechariah responds. And he responds in what I imagine is a way similar to how most of us might. He pushes back. In Luke, if we had kept reading and we got into verses 18 and 19 of chapter 1, after the angel had described how amazing this child will be, Zechariah says to the angel, how can you be sure of this? My wife and I are very old. There it is again, reminding us they're old. But the angel replied, I am Gabriel. I stand in God's presence. I was sent to speak to you and to bring this good news to you. I appreciate this back and forth because as Zechariah says, but I'm too old in disbelief, the angel simply replies, and I am Gabriel. As if to say, so? Who says you're too old other than you? How many of us have done that? I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too shy. I'm too inexperienced. We're quick to put limits on ourselves, aren't we? But here, when Zechariah puts limits on himself, the only reply he gets is, but I am Gabriel. I mean, who can argue with that? I'm pretty confident that I am not the only one among us who has ever felt a nudge from God and responded with a kind of doubt that said, no, 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 not me whether we're too young or old, or whether we think we're not enough, or whether we think, well, what could I do? I'm just one person. And yet in the same way as I can imagine our own responses being incredulous and doubtful in these kinds of moments, just like Zechariah, I wonder if God's response might be that of Gabriel's. As if we say, but how, God, or why, God, or not me, God? God says, well, what do you mean? I'm God. Nothing is impossible for me. It reminds me of an expression I try to remember when I'm doubtful or afraid or, or even just trying to hold on to control in a situation where I don't have it. I try to remember that God is God. And I am not. God is God, and I am not. In other words, God is the one who is always in control. God has a tendency to break into our ordinary lives and do extraordinary things. Things that you and I couldn't do alone. Things that perhaps we could never expect or even begin to dream of. And if we believe that God can help us do these incredible things, and I hope you do, then Zechariah's story perhaps is meant to serve as a reminder that God never acts alone, but instead longs to be in partnership with us as we help do God's work. Because even the smallest acts of kindness or caring can make a big impact 
on the world around us. And this year, especially with the world looking so different than we have ever seen before, with the hope of Christmas coming to us in a whole new way as we worship God only online today, perhaps these things serve as a reminder that God is calling us, you and I, each and every one of us, to be messengers of hope that we might use our words and our actions to share that hope with others. And if hope, as Sandy defined it, is expecting something to happen and having the confidence that it will, well, if that's hope, and if we are a people who get ready and prepare for these good things to happen, then I can't help but to wonder what God might be calling you to do as you live into the hope of God. You know, if we were together in person this morning, I might have given everyone, and not just the children, these little feathers like Sandy had in her time for young disciples. Feathers that can remind us of the ways that God is at work around us. That remind us of the ways perhaps the angels of God are all around us. Because you see, as we talk about the appearances of angels in this Christmas story, I find it helpful to imagine what they looked like. And since I already shared that I usually think of these large, winged creatures, I can't help but to wonder if perhaps just as angels are symbols of God's messengers to us and God's presence with us, then perhaps in the same way, these feathers can symbolize for us the Spirit of God and the ability to span any distance between heaven and earth. Perhaps these very same feathers might also invite us to consider the freedom of flight to new heights in our lives as we claim God's possibilities for our lives and for our world, much like we have dreamt about together in weeks past. When we talked throughout the month of November about imagining God-sized dreams coming to life here at First Church. Sometimes the lived reality of these God-sized dreams that we dream start with small, ordinary steps. And so this week, I want to invite you to look around to keep an eye out for feathers or other reminders that help us to keep our eyes open for God's messengers in our daily lives. Just as we are keeping our own eyes open for ways that we can serve and be those messengers of hope in the midst of each and every day with each and every person we meet. You and I, friends, are called and invited and needed in this world now especially to be those messengers of hope, to be that proverbial angel for all the people around us who don't maybe even know they need it. This is important because I do believe that there are angels among us. God is making us ready to be those messengers of hope flying in the face of fear in an ever-changing world. Will you step up to the challenge? Let's pray together. Faithful, loving God who reminds us in every step of our journey to trust in you, to be not afraid, and to embrace hope, we ask, O God, that you will put all around us symbols of that hope and of these gifts We ask, O God, that you will help us to be your servants who live into these gifts, who share them with all the world around us, and who embrace the good news of your presence drawing near to us this Christmas and always. All these things, O God, we give you thanks for this day. In the name of Christ Jesus, your Son. Amen.
we prepare to go forth today, I do want to remind you that this and every day God invites us to bring all of our gifts. Sometimes those gifts come in the form of worshiping and gathering together as we have today. Sometimes those come in the form of sharing the love and the hope of God with others we meet. And other times still those gifts come in the form of financial tithes and offerings. And so my invitation for you is to offer all of these gifts to God this day. You'll see on the screen before you that there is an opportunity always to give online. You're also welcome to give those financial gifts to the church. Friends, as we take a moment to share those gifts, won't you join with me as we offer a prayer of great gratitude for these gifts we offer. Faithful and loving and mighty and merciful God of hope, we give you thanks for the assurance that you are with us always, that you use these gifts for the good of your people and of your kingdom. And so for all that you have offered to us and the pieces of that that we offer to you in return, we give you thanks and ask that you will continue to bless us to be your generous people who share your hope with all the world around us. Amen. As we go forth today, might we go forth seeking to proclaim this hope and this promise that God is with us, that there are angels among us, and that you and I are invited to serve as those angels to others in our midst. Let us go forth seeking to be that hope and that love of God to others we meet this and every day. Amen.